Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hi, and welcome back. So, in my last episode, I shared with you some of my story and the way I used to define myself. I hope this inspired you to be able to look at your own definition of self and be curious about it and wonder how is it serving you in the here and now. Having grown up with fear and anxiety handed to me on a silver platter, just knowing that the worst case scenario can in fact happen, as I knew what was possible with my mom's parents' car accident, and knowing that you can't prevent bad things from happening, it made perfect sense why I kept making decisions for myself in order to help me feel safe and secure. Growing up being dependent on my mom and then shifting that dependence when I was a teenager onto my boyfriend who became my husband was exactly what I felt I needed to create a sense of safety and security. Not being safe and not being secure was what I feared the most. So no wonder I was so focused on feeling comfortable that I often never considered slowing down, questioning, or being curious about whether it was the right thing for me. The value of security at that time was higher than the value I later had of self-discovery, exploration, and even independence. And that was fine until it wasn't fine anymore. I mean, wow, even just saying that out loud makes me have so much compassion for my younger self. It's no wonder I've had so much transformation over the years. and <laughs> No wonder it wasn't easy. But when I can look back on it, my values have really shifted. And this awareness, like I said, I just give myself a lot of compassion for my younger self because I really didn't know any different. I really just wanted to feel safety in my life because I feared the unknown, something terrible. Well, before I discovered mindfulness, or as I like to say, mindfulness discovered me, I remember seeing an article in the Oprah magazine titled, Don't Worry, Be Happy which was actually published in November of 2000. I was all of 22 years old. I wasn't even engaged yet, although all I wanted to do at the time was get engaged. Remember, I was looking to create more safety and security to give me that perceived sense of comfort and in a way to prevent the scariness of the unknown. I even so much as taped a De Beers Diamond Is Forever ad onto my boyfriend's computer monitor so he could see it every day, as if I thought he'd forget what it was I was wanting. And while I can look back and say, wow, maybe I was kind of forcing this situation, or maybe I was pushing him towards something he wasn't ready for, it didn't really matter because that action of putting that diamond ad on his computer gave me a perceived sense of control over the situation. At least I was doing something about it. Almost everything that I did was a motivation for me to feel security for what was next. So the future just didn't seem so scary. And yet I was still always scared of the unknown. So even though my tactics didn't really work, I still persisted at them. I was pretty good at creating the same habits and patterns that got me no different solutions. Clearly, it took me a long time to learn this lesson. Anyhow, back to this Oprah article. It really spoke to me. It was about a woman who lived back east and felt that if she worried about things, then that worry would prevent her fears from coming true and from happening, as if this worry was like a shield of armor. And the worry also gave her something to do and made her feel like she could control something in a situation she otherwise didn't feel she had any. It really gave her a false sense of peace. So she would worry about lots of things. And they never actually came true. So it continued to serve her story of the value of worrying. 
In fact, this reminds me of the Mark Twain quote, which says, I've had lots of worries in my life, most of which never happened. Isn't this just so true about our fears? And I paraphrase what she writes in the article. She thought to herself, if I didn't know to worry about earthquakes, and sure enough, it happened, it's because I didn't know how to control against it. There's actually some humor in that because I can get how she felt. But there was this one paragraph in particular that really spoke to me. And it spoke to me so much that I actually photocopied it, kept copies of it everywhere, in my nightstand, my wallet, the door of my car, on my desk, anywhere I could easily reach for it the moment I felt overcome by fear. To give you some context, here's what the preceding paragraph said. Quote, of course, deciding to drop the worry habit is easier said than doing it. Changing any conditioned response takes time and self-awareness. But now, when the alarms start blaring in my head, I don't panic. Instead, I stop and notice my fear and even welcome it like a persistent old friend. Oh, it's you again, I observe. Okay. So that was the preceding paragraph for context. Here's the paragraph that changed my life. Quote, In the moment of clear-sightedness, I have a choice. I can be automatically swept away by a tidal wave of worry, or I can see it for what it is, a series of mental images that have nothing to do with reality but that wreak havoc in my mind and make my insides do crazy flip-flops. The more I'm able to see my worry for what it is and is not, the less control it has over me. Wow, that was so powerful to me. I had to learn to separate myself from my thoughts and see them as just that, thoughts. This was years before I knew what mindfulness was. And look at that. I was being mindful and didn't even know it. I was beginning to understand that power of awareness and how with that awareness, I was able to bring myself back into the present moment where, in fact, even if I worried about it, the worst case scenario wasn't happening. I began to recognize just how creative my mind could be. If only I knew how to use that power for good and not evil, I'd be set. Well, I'm working on that now. So I literally use that paragraph as my mantra for many, many years. And it helped me tremendously. I wasn't able to truly get out of the habit of worrying, but at least I was starting to gain greater awareness of it when I did. And, you know, you can't change what you're not aware of. And so that's always going to be the place to start is with awareness. In fact, I think awareness is my most favorite word. But sometimes that awareness can bring up judgment, fear, resistance, denial, or even an inability to see things objectively. This is why the way to begin to journey forward is to meet yourself where you're at. It's so much easier said than done when we're often not always happy with where we're at. But with greater practice, I know you'll get better at acceptance and allowing and not judging. So since I use mindfulness as the foundation of all the work I've done for myself and all the work that I use in teaching others, I wanted to talk further about mindfulness so we can really be on the same page as to how I define it and the language in which I'll be using for the remainder of our podcast series. And this will be the foundation for you to get unstuck from whatever isn't working. Without mindfulness, it's really easy to repeat patterns and expect a different outcome. In episode one, I briefly gave my overview of definition of mindfulness, but let's delve in deeper. So just think for a moment, what do you think of when you hear the word mindful or mindfulness? What comes to your mind? What do you think the definition of it means? The stock answer is often being in the present moment non-judgmentally. But 
Sounds, again, easier said than done. So what does that even mean to you? Well, let me start by saying something that I often hear from clients is, I don't have time to be mindful. I don't have time to add something else to my to-do list. So I'm here to let you know and remind you, mindfulness isn't something you add to your to-do list. It's actually what you should put onto your to-be list. Who do you want to be in the world? What's the quality of presence you have with your relationships, whether it's your spouse or partner or kids or the relationship to other family members or friends or even the level of presence you bring to your work or your hobbies and especially the level of presence bringing to your own self-care? So I want to remind you, mindfulness is not something to do. It's a way of being. And so because we don't have to create space to be, we just have to learn how to be in a more skillful way. So again, mindfulness is not something you add to your to-do list. You don't need to create the time to be more mindful. You just have to learn to incorporate that level of awareness into what you're already doing. It's something about who you are in the moment. And even though it's often defined as being in the present moment, I'm going to qualify this by saying, I don't think mindfulness is always actually about being aware. It's about noticing the moment you are no longer aware. It's noticing that you're no longer present. I mean, really, this is the key. It's near impossible to be present and aware all the time. But we do want to increase the awareness of the moments when we've wandered off, we've let our attention go away, and we're no longer aware that we're even being aware. Not being aware is what gets us really stuck. As soon as we can increase the awareness of when we're not aware, we're inherently going to become more aware. I know it sounds a little confusing as I say that. But before we can even get to that point of uh, that level of awareness, let's create a solid understanding and basis of what I talk about when it means to be mindful. And I'm going to go over these different areas fairly briefly because I'm sure in time I'll have episodes that will delve much deeper into each of these areas with much greater depth. So like I said... If I were to give a one-word definition of mindfulness, it would be awareness. So what is it we want to be aware of? Well, it's awareness of anything that's arising in the moment. So that could be thoughts, emotions, sensations, distractions, our actions, our words, people around us, our surroundings, what we're doing. It's simply being aware of what's arising in the moment. Okay, another definition that I give to a piece of being mindful is about paying attention. Part of that paying attention is noticing whether or not we're on autopilot or whether or not we're fully engaged in the moment. You know, I like to give this example of if you drive to work or if you drive your kids to school And we often just go through the motions and we get in our car and our car just knows where to go. We don't even really have to pay attention. It's literally just being on autopilot. So when we're more mindful, we are paying attention to those things that we are otherwise doing automatically. Another key word of my definition of mindfulness is intention. Why are we doing what we're doing? Are we even aware of making the connections between our thoughts and our emotions and our words? Are we reacting out of fear or anxiety? Are we looking at everything through a lens of how things used to be in the past? Or are we projecting into the future? Are we reacting in conversation because we're in anticipation of what someone might say? And we no longer have an intention to know why am I saying what I'm saying next? Because I thought I was, you know, playing out the conversation in my mind of what was going to be happening. So to have an intention is to know why we're doing what we're doing. And unless we are being aware, 
it's hard to have an intention and always to make that connection to be present. And again, all of this is much easier said than done. This is why it's considered to be a practice. So awareness, attention, intention are the main three words that I use to describe to be able to be aware of, am I being aware? I know I keep saying the word awareness a lot. And to me, it's really that important. So key definition, being in the present moment. So this bears a great question. If you're not in the present moment, where are you? Well, neuroscientists say that our minds wander at least 47% of the time. And I don't know exactly the date of that study that showed that, but it's my assertion that our minds actually wander more. And, you know, we add into the mix of digital devices and it's really easy for us to be out of the present moment. So if we're not in the present moment, where are we? Well, our minds wander to the past and our minds wander to the future. So when our minds go to the past, what happens there? Well, often that's where we ruminate, we get stuck, we play things over in our mind. We say things like, oh, if only I wouldn't have said that or if only that didn't happen. And when our mind is in the future, it goes to what if this happens? What if, what if, what if? So in really, really simple terms, when our mind is in the past, we're stuck ruminating and it can often lead to symptoms of feeling depressed. And if our mind is in the future, it can often lead to fear and anxiety. It's all of that unknown. So it goes back and forth between a if only and a what if. So one of the keys of being mindful of being present is to be aware and to sit with what is. What is is what's happening here in the present moment. Okay, another key component of being mindful is non judgmental awareness. So as soon as something is in a definition that says that we're not supposed to have any judgment, I think this is really tricky because I don't know about you, but I still have judgments. I think it's a part of the human condition. I think it's really easy to be judgmental towards others. The key with being more mindful about our judgments is to not act on those judgments. It's to have the awareness of, oh, wow, look at that. I'm really being judgmental toward this other person. I wonder if that's based on something else in the past that I'm drawing upon as a story I'm operating out of, or let me notice if my judgment on this other person is bringing up something in myself that I'm unable to look at. So part of that non-judgmental awareness is the ability to allow and accept what's ever arising. And again, All of this is easier said than done, but we'll get to more on this. Um, A key component on being non-judgmental is practicing what's called equanimity. And equanimity is most easily defined as having an evenness of mind. It's not grouping everything into good or bad, positive or negative. It's really that practice of allowing and accepting one what is. It's about not being in resistance to what is. And it's that ability to not resist what is that can help break us out of a pattern of reactivity. Because as humans, we tend to want to strive and work towards what feels good. And we tend to want to push away and resist or deny what doesn't feel good. And the truth is, we can't always do those things. Sometimes we have to sit with what doesn't feel good. We have to allow and accept it. Doesn't mean we like it. And this is something I will talk a lot more about as acceptance, because often I have a lot of clients say to me, well, how can I accept what I don't like? Yeah, it's a great question. And not accepting what you don't like doesn't make it go away. In fact, not accepting it makes it bigger because we tend to then have it in resistance and denial. And now we're putting some negative attention on it, which is actually making it grow. So like I said, we'll talk about this more in the future. So other really key components to developing a mindfulness practice, gratitude, compassion, loving kindness. These are all ways for us to be more mindful. 
You know, compassion is something that can help us get out of a reactive mind when we are treating ourselves with kindness and we are not judging ourselves for what's arising, but to just cut ourselves some slack. And especially to learn to do this to others. And, you know, it's one of those practices that the more we can practice compassion, the easier it becomes. And so to have this practice of loving kindness as a foundation for mindfulness is is really, really helpful. And especially when you get stuck in reactive patterns that keep you out of the present moment, practicing that self-compassion is one of those ways you can come back into the present moment with allowing, um, with accepting, even if you don't like it. So again, easier said than done. And we'll talk more about how to do this, but I'm just giving you the foundation. Gratitude. You know, this is a really, really beautiful practice and can help us be more in the present moment because sometimes we don't like what's happening. But to be able to look for the good and find the good and focus on the good actually makes the good grow. Um, I'll talk at another time about our brains and neuroscience and having a negativity bias. But choosing gratitude is one of the ways that we can rewire our brains towards healthier habits and patterns. So understanding that it's often been a habit to focus on the negative, so it becomes an intention to focus on the positive. Another one I mentioned in there is loving kindness, and this is extending well wishes to others. And again, beautiful practice, and sometimes easier said than done, but it can get us out of that cycle of reactivity, out of the cycle of it being difficult to be in the present moment when we can practice that loving kindness, whether it's to someone that we're having difficulty with, whether it's to someone we love, or especially extending that loving kindness to yourself. And the foundation of all of this mindfulness practice is developing a connection to your breath. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the power of our breath, but Think of your mind like a hyper puppy and your puppy's, you know, going to run all over the place because that's what a puppy's going to do. And hopefully you don't get mad at the puppy for being a puppy. You just simply have to learn to train the puppy. So the breath becomes a leash on that hyper puppy when it runs away and you just use the breath to bring your mind back into the present moment. So, you know, the mind is going to wander. The mind is going to do what the mind does. And that's not our fault. That's just our mind doing, like I said, exactly what the mind is intended to do, which is to think. And the practice of being more mindful is to have the awareness of, oh, look, my mind has wandered off, not to judge myself for the fact that it has wandered and just use my breath as an anchor to bring the mind back to the here and the now. So that pretty much covers the the broad definition of when I talk about being mindful, what am I saying? So awareness, attention, intention, being in the present moment, not being judgmental, having equanimity, practicing gratitude, compassion, loving kindness, and using our breath as an anchor into the present moment. So now that you have all this as the foundation, you'll understand where I'm coming from when I talk about being more mindful. And let me tell you, I teach mindfulness in the way I wish I learned it. I teach it in a way that hopefully you'll find to be tangible, accessible, relatable, and able to bring into your own life. Because when I learned about mindfulness, it felt like such an esoteric practice. I wasn't even really sure what it meant. And it took me years to truly not only understand it, but to integrate it. And I don't want it to take that long for you which is why it's so important to create a solid understanding. And I'll keep talking about it, probably often repeating what I've already said, but that repetition will lead to your mastery. And each time you listen, you'll hear it in a different way. You'll relate to some new piece maybe you didn't catch the first time because you're different now than you were the last time you listened. So even if you repeat these podcasts, I guarantee you'll hear retain or get something new from it each time. So to finish up, I just wanted to share. Uh, Recently, I was in Costa Rica on a retreat 
Which, by the way, side note, my boyfriend and I are going to be leading a retreat at this amazing mountaintop resort in April of 2020. So stay tuned for more info on that. But they have the most amazing body workers and healers than anywhere I've been. And it's a massage isn't just a massage there. It's really an intuitive healing session, truly. And when I was there, one of the wellness therapists before our session began asked me why I became a marriage and family therapist. What drew me into this profession? And aside from the obvious answers I had, my truest answer was that I wanted to guide others in creating the same kind of change that I had done for myself because I knew it was possible. And I knew if I could do it, anyone could do it. And I wanted to be that inspiration to others. I never thought I'd be able to break free from my old patterns of fear and anxiety. I thought that was just who I was because it's in part where I've come from and it was in my DNA. And while yes, that's true, it's also true that I was able to change. And I'm so grateful that I have a framework that guided me in that change. Does my mindfulness practice always work for me? No. Is it always easy? No. Do I still get stuck? Yeah, of course I do. I'm human. The difference is when I'm stuck, I know how to get out. And I don't use that being stuck as my only truth. I have self-compassion for myself when I am, and I go back to my tools. And now, as you develop more, so can you. So for your practice today, I invite you to consider what it is you want to change that you've been telling yourself just isn't possible. And then be curious about it. Be curious how to develop more of a mindful response, because that is just a thought. It's just fear. It's just anxiety. So remember, it's all a practice. You won't get there overnight, but you can take the baby steps. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you next time. Bye. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E. R-O-S-E dot com.